Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be aware that this series may contain images, voices or names of deceased persons. This episode, Multicultural Mosaic, is part of the series that deals with people. It begins in Sydney, the site of the first European settlement, and ends in Canberra, the site of Australia's national capital. We consider the immense contribution waves of immigrants have made to the making of a nation, and we question the purpose of closing our borders. Welcome to Sydney, the glittering state capital of New South Wales. Sydney is Australia's largest city, and we've chosen this series' largest object from here. It's that unmistakable Australian icon, the Opera House. And we've chosen the Opera House for three very special reasons. First of all, the site, where the Opera House actually stands. Here, on the edge of Port Jackson, near the entrance to Sydney Harbour, the waterway that laps all around this great city landscape. It's through the harbour's entrance, the heads, that Sydney's first white immigrants came. Here, those first convict prisoners found landfall in Australia. So in a way, this is the place, the site of the first European settlement, where the story, the story of immigration to this country really begins. The second reason has to do with origins. For many people, the Opera House is the archetypal symbol of Australia. And you'll find it on key rings, tea towels, even snow domes in every tourist shop in Sydney. And yet its designer, Jan Utzen, was a Danish architect. Those distinctive white sails there found their inspiration, like so much of Australia's culture, in the land oceans and oceans away. So this particular structure reminds us of the myriad different peoples who've contributed to building and the reimagining of Australia. Thirdly and finally, there's the form, the form this remarkable architectural statement takes. I guess everyone's got their own interpretation of the Opera House. Some people liken it to sails on Sydney Harbour or sharks cutting through that water. Utzen described it as an orange broken open into segments. But you know, our favourite explanation of the Opera House's inspiration is the metaphor of waves. The waves that surround the shores of Sydney Harbour and encircle this great continent as a whole. Those waves carry those first convicts to Australia and they also remind us of the waves of different immigrants who have made this land their home. Those waves began, as Bruce just said, with Australia's British settlers. But even that first convict society was culturally diverse, made up of men and women from all across the British Isles, Scotland, England, Ireland, Wales and beyond. And even before the British invasion in 1788, there was a long history of journeys from Asia to Australia. From as early as the 1400s, fishermen from Makassar in modern day Indonesia journeyed to northern Australia in regular seasonal migrations. They came to gather tripang, sea slug, a delicacy sold in Asian markets. We call them sojourners. The monsoon winds carried them to Australia and carried them home again with that valuable harvest. It was that search for things of value that fueled the first mass migration from Asia to Australia. In the 1850s, tens of thousands of Chinese travelled south all keen to find a fortune on the gold fields of Eastern Australia. They were joined by Americans, Canadians and people from all across Europe. As far as immigration was concerned, gold changed Australia overnight, from a place of exile for a colony of British convicts to a diverse and cosmopolitan community. Now everyone wanted to come here. They wanted to come, but really they had to come. From the 1840s, these shores provided shelter. They provided sustenance for thousands, thousands fleeing the famine in Ireland. Again, Australian history has to be seen in a global context. The 19th century was a time of mass migration all the world over. 
Australia may have been a British colony, but throughout the late 19th century, Afghan cameleers carried goods across the arid interior of Australia. Labourers from the Pacific Island worked the cane fields of Queensland. Japanese pearlers swam our waters in the tropical north and miners and seamen came from one end of the globe to the other. Those waves of migration continue. They continue after the Second World War as displaced men and women, refugees from all across Europe, are recruited to build the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme. The Snowy, as we like to call it, remains this country's most ambitious engineering project. The energy that powered Australia came from the toil of Poles and Latvians, Italians, Greeks and Germans. So in a way, Australia was always a multicultural society and that cultural diversity is all too evident today. Melbourne is one of the world's largest Greek cities, second only to Athens. And the children and grandchildren of Turkish migrants brought out to work in factories of an expanding economy occupy key positions in government and industry. Our universities host students from hundreds of different countries, including thousands from China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore. Australia is multicultural and we are multi-faith. This is St James. It's one of the oldest surviving churches in Sydney. This great building was consecrated in 1824 and religious services have been held here ever since. Back then, in colonial times, Christianity was the dominant faith of Australians. White Australians, that is. Christianity never supplanted the rich spiritual legacy of Aboriginal people. The stories of the dreaming explained every feature of this landscape. They offered laws to live by, they evoked a complex cosmology, and then, as now, transcended space and time. Sydney, like the rest of Australia, is home to more than 100 different faiths. And not far from here, you'll find synagogues and mosques, chapels and temples, the great cathedrals of Christendom, right down to the small and humble places of worship and belief. For countless thousands, Australia has proved a land of opportunity. People of different faiths, different cultures, have built new lives here often escaping poverty and persecution in the lands of their birth. But immigration isn't just a story of acceptance and success. Far, far from it. Migrant labour was cheap labour. That's why government and private employers recruited overseas workers in the first place. Migrants worked the longest hours, in the worst jobs, for the poorest pay. And in many ways, they were marginalised by mainstream Australian society. Today, the trade union movement welcomes all workers to its ranks. In the 19th and much of the 20th century, so-called coloured labour was feared and resented. Foreign workers were seen as a threat to the wages and conditions won by white Australians. And here you see a paradox in the history of our country. From long before the first fleet sailed into Sydney, Australia was a place of tremendous cultural diversity. Aboriginal Australia is an instance of that. Over 300 language groups, each unique and distinctive, spanning one end of the continent to the other. Now we could have kept that rich and complex character. The new society we built here could have been open, tolerant, pluralistic. Instead, and here's the paradox, most colonial Australians define themselves as British. We strive to create what we called a white Australia, a society that turned its back on the world's oldest continuous civilization and that denied a simple statement of geography. Australia surely is a part of Asia. You'll find a monument to white Australia here, right in the heart of Sydney. It's the Customs House. And from the mid 19th century, when the building construction began, to the early days of the Commonwealth, when the building was finally complete, this country made, enforced and refined the white Australia policy. Those windows up there look out over the harbour, monitoring every ship as it comes into this bay. And back then, as today, not all those boats were welcome. The purpose of this building was to protect Australia's borders. Customs officials decided who would enter this country and when and how. 
It's here and in customs houses like this one that Australia's restrictive immigration policies came into practice. First came the poll tax. Now that's a charge of a staggering £10 per person. And it was levied on those Chinese gold seekers coming into Melbourne and into Sydney. So to get around this, boatloads of Chinese landed in South Australia instead and walked to the Victorian gold fields. The journey took over five weeks and it's the largest single migration in modern Australia's history. And then, then comes the dictation test. In 1901, the Commonwealth of Australia is created. And the very first legislation enacted by our very first national parliament is the Immigration Restriction Act. Under the Act, any immigrant to Australia could be forced to carry out a dictation test in any European language. Those tests were administered here, in this very building, and they had very little to do with linguistic aptitude. Egon Kisch, a political radical, was fluent in English, in French, in German. So what do customs officials do? They administer his test in Scottish Gaelic instead. The Customs House controlled the flow of people into Australia and it checked the flow of ideas as well. Customs officials decided the books that Australians could read and the films they could watch. This was the place where art, people and politics were labelled foreign, obscene, undesirable. So in a way, this building was a bulwark against the outside world. It embodied the narrow, insular ideal of the white Australia policy. Well, Australia's changed a great deal since then. And you can see that here, in this very building. Once the Customs House was about closing Australia's doors. Now, it's one of Australia's liveliest public libraries. It's free, it's open to all. In 1973, a progressive Labor government formally abolished the white Australia policy. Today, immigrants and investment from Asia is welcomed rather than feared. And this country, this country has proved itself one of the most successful and inclusive multicultural societies in the world. In Australia, around 20% of our population is born overseas. Compare that with 12% in the US, 13% in Britain. And unlike Britain or the US or so many countries in Europe, social diversity has come with a high degree of social cohesion. In Australia, we're living and we're learning together. Our country has changed. The question is, have we changed enough? Some Australians still talk of turning back the boats, still fear those of different faiths or cultures to their own, still long for the inward looking world embodied in this building. But many Australians would also say that's a world that belongs to Australia's past, not to its future. We began this episode at the Opera House. We'll end it here in Canberra, beneath the windows of the National Museum of Australia. As you can see, the designers of the National Museum incorporated the Opera House into the very architecture of this building. And in that, in that they were making a very powerful statement. You see, back in the 1970s, when the Opera House was built, it was seen by some as being too unusual, too confronting, too courageous. Today, it's part of the landscape of a modern, multicultural Australia, an Australia that welcomes and that celebrates difference and diversity. These windows, like the Opera House that inspired them, look out on and engage the world. And embracing the whole world, not just a small, selective part of it, is surely at the heart of Australia's multicultural vision. If you'd like to learn more about the issues raised in this episode, why not catch Susan Carland in conversation? This time, Susan's talking to Julian Burnside, QC, in a lecture at Monash University.